the survey link. Our American President's Life Portrait Series now continues with a look at the sixth chief executive, John Quincy Adams. Earlier this year, we broadcast live from the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. But first, here's a brief look at the life and times of John Quincy Adams. He was a politician and a poet, a diarist and a diplomat. He liked billiards, played the flute, and was the first president to have his picture taken. While in office, he took morning swims in the Potomac River. And of the first seven chief executives, he and his father were the only two not to have owned slaves. He was John Quincy Adams, the nation's sixth president. I never was and never shall be what is commonly termed a popular man. I'm certainly not intentionally repulsive in my manners and deportment, but I have no powers of fascination, none of the honey which the profligate proverb says is the true flycatcher. He was born in Quincy, Massachusetts, to the revolutionary John Adams and his wife Abigail. They held high expectations for their eldest son. His father once told him, If you do not rise to the head not only of your profession, but of your country, it will be owing to your own laziness, slovenliness, and obstinacy. A child during the American Revolution, John Quincy was eight when he witnessed the Battle of Bunker Hill while standing beside his mother on a nearby hilltop. An exceptionally bright young man, his father on diplomatic missions abroad. After graduating from Harvard, it took him just two years, he entered public life as minister to the Netherlands. Three years later, his father was elected the country's second president. John Quincy became a U.S. senator and then minister to Russia and Britain before being appointed Secretary of State under James Monroe. Though an effective diplomat, Adams soon became known for his prickly personality. One colleague called him hard as a piece of granite and cold as a lump of ice. I am a man of reserved, cold, austere, and forbidding manners. My political adversaries say a gloomy misanthrope. My personal enemies, an unsocial savage. Adams did have an aloof manner. At dinner parties, he seldom bothered with small talk. Nor was he interested in clothes. Some say he wore the same hat for 10 years. But he was fastidious about writing regularly, and from age 29 to 49, recorded something in his diary every single day. He even published a small volume of his own poetry. Adams ran for president in 1824 and won, but only technically. Andrew Jackson received more popular and electoral votes, but because no candidate in the four-man election had secured a majority, the decision was thrown to the House, which selected Adams. Jackson's supporters were furious, and those in Congress proceeded to thwart several of Adams' proposals as president. Adams also endured rocky relations with his vice president, John Calhoun, who went on to serve under Jackson. Of his presidential years, Adams wrote, I can scarcely conceive a more harassing, wearying, teasing condition of existence. Adams' first lady was Louisa Johnson Adams. Born in London, she remains the only first lady born outside the United States. Louisa read Greek, wrote French poetry, and played the harp but she remained intimidated by the formidable family into which she had married. As regards women, the Adams family are one and all peculiarly harsh and severe in their characters. There seems to exist no sympathy, no tenderness for the weakness of the sex. Louisa called her memoirs Adventures of a Nobody. Adams served in Washington for one presidential term from 1825 to 1828 losing his second bid for office to his arch enemy, Jackson. Dejected, Adams, like his father before him, skipped his successor's inaugural and returned home to Massachusetts. A year later, however, he was on his way back to Washington after his election to the U.S. House of Representatives. He served there for 17 years, earning the nickname Old Man Eloquent. During this time, he was instrumental in establishing the Smithsonian Institution, as well as in winning freedom for a group of slaves captured aboard the Spanish ship Amistad. Adams was in the House chamber on February 23, 1848, when, 
just after voting against a proposal to decorate Mexican war generals, he suffered a massive stroke. Five doctors attended him, four of them members of the house. Lying on a sofa in the speaker's room, he uttered his last words. This is the end of Earth. I am content. He fell into a coma and died two days later. He was 80. Welcome to the sixth of 41 programs devoted to the American presidents this year. You're looking at the Massachusetts Historical Society here in Boston, which houses the papers of the second president of the United States, John Adams and his wife, Abigail, as well as the papers of their son, the sixth president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, and those of his wife, Louisa Catherine Adams. The Massachusetts Historical Society is located right in the city of Boston, near Fenway Park on Boylston, you can see right there our school bus located outside on this day. And we have at least four people you're going to meet during the next couple of hours. Lynn Hudson Parsons, who is with the State University of New York at Brockport, a history professor and a biographer of John Quincy Adams. William Fowler, the director of this institution, the Massachusetts Historical Society. Celeste Walker, who's the associate editor of the Adams Papers. And Peter Byrd will join us from the United States Capitol in Statuary Hall. He is in the guide service there, and we'll talk about the relationship of John Quincy Adams to the House of Representatives where he served for 17 years. Here in the Ellis Room is Lynn Hudson Parsons, professor, follower of John Quincy Adams. What was the relationship like between John Quincy Adams and his wife, Louisa Catherine Adams? They were married for um, more than half a century. It was a uh, marriage not entirely free from tension. Uh, there were some periods of time in which I suspect they did not have much to say to one another, but it survived, obviously, for those 50 years. What were his children like? He had uh, three sons and an infant daughter uh, who uh, died uh, uh, in, in Russia after about a year. Um, two out of the three sons were um, less than successful in their careers. They died in their late 20s. They are under enormous pressure, I think, from the Adamses in general, as the introduction indicated. Uh, the, the, there was always in that generation a great deal of personal pressure to succeed, to fulfill what they had uh, imagined was their destiny uh, for the nation. And uh, two out of the three sons didn't make it. Uh, the third son, Charles Francis Adams, uh, did. He went on uh, to a distinguished uh, diplomatic career on his own. Uh, representing the United States uh, during the Civil War uh, in London, having been appointed to that position by Abraham Lincoln, uh, and is generally accredited to have been one of the more outstanding uh, ambassadors to Great Britain, uh, along with his father and grandfather, who also had that same position. As we have during this series, we want you to join us by telephone. The numbers are going to be popped up there on the screen, and you'll be able to uh, join us very, very soon. That's 202-624-1111 if you live in the eastern and central time zone, 202-624-1115 if you live in the mountain and Pacific time zones. Uh, Professor Parsons, how long have you followed John Quincy Adams? Uh, about a quarter of a century. Uh, my original doctoral dissertation did not deal directly with the Adamses. It uh, dealt more with Alexander Hamilton and his uh, posthumous uh, reputation, what historians and politicians did to his, uh, his reputation, uh, why he's on the $10 bill, why there's no uh, Hamilton Memorial in Washington to match the Jefferson Memorial, and so on. But I, I gradually realized that a good deal of the, uh, the image that people have today of Hamilton was influenced by the Adamses, who didn't like him very much. Um, and I became, after I finished the dissertation, I kind of moved into the, uh, the Adamses and focused on the, uh, on the second Adams. Now, Celeste Walker is going to show us later on some boxes in the other room, 30 of them filled with the diaries. Oh, yes. John Quincy Adams. Have you read all that? Uh, no, I've not read the whole diary from front to back. I've read large portions of it. Uh, um, it, it exists uh, in a 12-volume published form. But that's only, I believe, think about two-thirds of it. The remaining third has never been published. That's available on microfilm for those who want to uh, look at it in most of the major research libraries. Of the We're going to take a telephone call in just a second. What did you think of John Quincy Adams yourself? 
Well, I, one, one can't help but be impressed with the length of his career. This is a person who knew Benjamin Franklin uh, and who died uh, in the House of Representatives in the same room with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so you have within his lifetime uh, a good uh, encapsulation of the history of the early republic. And secondly, uh, the wide range of offices that he held. I don't think any president uh, in before or since has held the range of offices, including a state legislator, a congressman, senator, a secretary of state, uh, representing the United States uh, to the Netherlands, to Prussia, to Russia, to Great Britain, negotiating the end of the War of 1812, a secretary of state, uh, and, then, and then president. And he also was appointed to the Supreme Court, although he uh, turned that down. We can talk about that a little later. Columbia, South Carolina, our first call for this program. Go ahead, please. You're on with Professor Parsons. Uh, good morning. Nice to speak with you today. Uh, thank you for doing this special. Um, I'd like to uh, first say to uh, Professor Parsons, that, uh, my wife is a SUNY Geneseo graduate, so that's right nearby, and we lived there Wonderful. Until, until we moved here into South Carolina. Good to hear it. Um, I've, uh, I've studied quite a bit about John Quincy Adams, and um, uh, Paul Nagel, in his book uh, made the comparison of intellect between John Quincy Adams and his wife Louisa and he seemed to think that uh, uh, she might have actually been superior in intellect to him now I don't think so uh, I've, I've read quite a bit of his work and uh, I'd like your comments on that and also uh, maybe compare uh, his, his uh, intellect with his father and um, I'm kind of curious on, on your on uh, his writing uh, Publica in um, response to Thomas 1792, uh, yes. Rights of Man. Thanks, Columbia. Okay, let's take the easy one first, uh, and that's the comparison between uh, the son and the father. I would say that John Adams was a much more profound thinker than his son. Uh, John Adams has some claim to be, has made some original contributions to political theory uh, as part of the uh, case against Great Britain in the, uh, in the um, American Revolution. I don't think you can make that claim for his son. The son's interests, however, I think were much broader. Uh, John Quincy Adams was interested in literature, he was interested in the theater, he was interested in science, he knew uh, a lot about music, he was perhaps the leading authority on the Bible uh, during uh, his uh, uh, later years. Uh, so we're, t we're contrasting depth with breadth, I think, in, in that matter. With regard to the, uh, the uh, comparison between John Quincy Adams and his wife, Anytime you deal with uh, the career of a woman uh, in the 18th or 19th and possibly even the 20th century, you have to recognize that the social uh, constraints on the development of any, practically any woman's intellect was such that we really can't answer that question. Uh, Paul Nagel is, is, is quite possibly correct that potentially uh, Louisa Catherine Adams had the same range of intellect, the same potential that John Quincy did, because she lived in a but because she lived in a society where that was not allowed to blossom, uh, we will never know. Uh, the third item, uh, the Publicola letters, uh, which were published uh, in the early 1790s as a uh, an attempt to refute Thomas Paine's uh, uh, defense of the uh, French Revolution. Uh, those uh, ran, I think there are about half a dozen of them, and as you probably know, uh, most people thought that they had been written by John Adams, where in fact they had been written by his son, and they kind of contributed to the beginning of the differences between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, which would ultimately end, uh, as you know, at least for the, uh, in the 1790s, in their opposing each other twice for the presidency, once in 1796 and again in 1800. One of the reasons we're doing this is for education purposes, and our cable in the classroom, C-SPAN in the classroom organization is ready to um, enroll you if you are a teacher. You can see on the screen there the telephone numbers and the website. Folks are there at the office uh, to take your call. That's 202-626-4858. Those of you who want to uh, connect via the internet at cspan.org slash classroom. There are lesson plans and there are materials that you can use in the classroom available to you all free of charge. Give our group a call this morning if you want to and get involved in all this. There's no money exchange. It's a chance for you to use audio, visual, and printed materials from us in the classroom. And we are at the Massachusetts Historical Society. The reason we're here instead of over at the homes, which aren't that far away from here, the Adams Mansion in Quincy is just 20, 25 minutes away. 
Uh, we're here because we were there for the second show with uh, David McCullough, and we talked just about John Adams. We also have here the director of this institution, Bill Fowler, is over in the other room and can tell us a little bit more about what the, what's in this institution, Mr. Fowler. Good morning, Brian. Welcome to the Historical Society. Nice to be <laughs> here. And uh, you've got things here other than just Adams material, don't you? Oh, we certainly do. Within this building, we have something in, in excess of 10 million manuscripts, uh, 5,000 maps, quarter of a million books, broadsides. It's an enormous collection. Outside the Library of Congress, Brian, if you allow me to brag a bit, this is the most, most important collection of American history. How long has this building been here? This building has been here exactly 100 years this month. Uh, the building was constructed for the Historical Society and was opened in April of 1899. This, however, is not our first home or our only home. The Society was founded in 1791. We are the oldest historical society in the United States. And in fact, we are the oldest historical society in the world devoted to collecting American manuscripts. I know you taught 26 years at yeah. Northeastern University. Also uh, got your PhD at Notre Dame. I certainly did. I, the first 26 years I spent in the classroom and enjoyed every minute of it. How long have you been here? I've been here now about 15 months. And if, uh, if memory serves me right, you've got something of value in your hands. Oh, I certainly do. Uh, today is a very special day here in Boston. It is the 18th of April. Uh, some of you, some of your viewers will certainly remember the poem, uh, Listen, My Children, and You Shall Hear, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. It was the 18th of April in 75, when hardly a man is now alive. So today is the 224th anniversary of Paul Revere's ride. Our founders in, 17, in the 1790s, and in particular a man named Jeremy Belknap, was very concerned to collect the materials of American history. These were men who had lived through the creation of the American Republic. And so Belknap went about like a prowling wolf collecting manuscripts and material. Of course, in the 1790s, Paul Revere was still very much an important citizen of this town. So Mr. Belknap went to Mr. Revere and asked him if he would write down what happened on the 18th of April in 1775. Mr. Revere responded, and the document that you now see on the screen is in fact in Mr. Revere's own hand, and this is his report, which he gave to Jeremy Belknap on the 1st of January, 1798, describing what happened to him. And I'd like to read just a small portion of that document, which may be quite familiar to many of your viewers. Mr. Revere describes how he had just returned from a ride to Lexington. This was a ride prior to the 18th of April. And he describes what happened when he came back. And here's how he reported it to Jeremy Belknap. I returned at night through Charlestown. There I agreed with Colonel Conant and some other gentlemen that if the British went out by water, we would show two lanterns in the North Church steeple, and if by land, one, as a signal. For we were apprehensive it would be difficult to cross the Charles River or get over Boston Neck. And of course, indeed, on the evening of the 18th of April, at Old North Church, one if by land, two if by sea. This, by the way, is the report that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had an opportunity to see, and this is the report upon which he based his epic poem in, that he wrote in 1863. Bill Fowler, let me ask you a couple of quick questions, and then we're going to let you go and bring you back later, but the Massachusetts Historical Society is underwritten by whom? The Society is a private society, Brian, and we're supported by the generosity of our members, and we're also supported by various foundations and granting agencies. We've been generously supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the National Historic Records Publication Commission. How much of a budget do you have every year? We have an annual budget of about $2 million. We have a full-time staff of approximately 26 people. People allowed to visit? Oh, not only allowed, encouraged. In fact, it's hard to imagine that any serious student of American history would not have to come here at some point in their work in order to consult our materials. What's we, are, we are free and open to the public. So it does not cost anything to belong? No, we do not charge for using our materials. Thanks for joining us, with, uh, Bill Fowler. We really appreciate your hospitality. And we have a call waiting in Saratoga, Wyoming. Go ahead, please. 
Good morning, Brian. As a longtime resident of Boston and a proud graduate of Boston University, I'm glad to see your your clips from uh, Boston this morning. And I have two questions about John Quincy Adams. First, if I could, I'd like to thank you for getting me a wife indirectly. When I moved to a remote area of the country and didn't have C-SPAN, I asked a couple people I knew to help me with petitions to get on the local cable company and one of the women came back so quickly with her petition filled I asked her how she did it she said she went to the branch office of the bank first she asked the branch manager to sign it then everybody else signed it and as a consequence we were able to get on our get C-SPAN on our cable so I was glad for that Thanks. My, my two questions this morning the first is what is exactly the pronunciation of John Quincy Adams' name? I always understood that it was Quincy. And oh, boy. <laughs> it would, I, I think it would depend on what century you're living in. I always understood you pronounced the, uh, the C in Quincy as more like a Z, as in Quincy. John and Adams, I assume, you is not a problem, but, but my understanding, you, you, it's a, a Z instead of a C. What's your second question, caller? And my second question, my wife says to ask you, are you going to cover in your wonderful presidential series, are you going to cover the forgotten president? And? And she says his name is Jefferson Davis. Thanks for C-SPAN. Thank you. Jefferson Davis, of course, is buried in the same cemetery with John Monroe and John Tyler. And at some point along the way, we will be talking about Jefferson Davis. On the telephone is Reverend Sheldon Bennett, who is the pastor of the First Parish Church over in Quincy, Massachusetts, where the two presidents named Adams are buried. Good morning, uh, Reverend Bennett. Are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, Brian. I know you're busy and you've got to preach this morning, and we appreciate your time for these few minutes. Tell us why you have closed the crypt below your church there where people used to visit the two presidents well, and their two not, wives. It's not something that we wanted to do. Um, for many years we had run a, uh, a volunteer program, um, uh, but it became increasingly difficult to find someone to manage that on a volunteer basis full time. So in 1992 we had entered into an agreement with the Park Service by which they would uh, provide a ranger, but it remained our responsibility because of issues of church and state to manage the building and to provide a staff person um, full-time for the seven months of the uh, tourist season. Um, to help us with that, the mayor of the city had pledged his support to raise, you know, private contributions and corporate sponsorships uh, to help us with our additional uh, costs so it wouldn't be a burden to the church, but that became increasingly uh, difficult in recent years. We began running um, a fairly large deficit for us and we just weren't able financially to continue it until we're uh, able to uh, obtain uh, sufficient funding. So we were just uh, much, much against our wishes. We just find ourselves in a position of not being able to, um, you know, to bear the costs uh, at the present time. How long do you think the crypt will be closed to the public? Well, I'm hoping um, uh, it'll be a very short period of time. We, uh, we do have plans. Uh, we're going to the uh, to the community to uh, solicit funds uh, to help us with the costs and if we're successful with that in the next few weeks hopefully we'll be uh, open shortly but I cannot tell you right now when whether it's uh, four weeks or six weeks or two months I, I just don't know and how much money do you have to raise well uh, probably to, to open the program we'll need to raise about uh, forty one thousand dollars to uh, um, clear up the uh, deficit and enable us to hire a staff person uh, for the season. And if someone wants to get involved in this, where do they contact you? They can contact us here at United First Parish Church, um, 1306 Hancock Street uh, in Quincy, 02169, or to call our uh, church office, area 617-773-1290. We have a separate um, account for the public visitor program that's called Church of the Presidents Visitor Program. Is the church open for people to visit? Oh, yes. We're open for our regular um, Sunday worship services and uh, uh, other events from time to time. It's just that we're not able to be open seven days a week um, on, the, you know, on the full schedule from April through November uh, at the present time. Reverend Sheldon Bennett, pastor of the First uh, Parish Church in Quincy, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, you're very welcome.
And for our guest here on the set in the Ellis Hall of the Massachusetts Historical Society, as we feature uh, a look at John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, we go next to a call from, it was on the screen there a moment, Shorewood, Illinois. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, C-SPAN is wonderful, Brian. Uh, Thanks. My question Thank you. for the professor has to do with uh, uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. It has always struck me that the political dynamics uh, surrounding the Quincy Adams administration and the Reagan administration were very similar to some of the political dynamics surrounding the, uh, Car the, uh, the uh, Jimmy Carter administration and the Ronald Reagan administration. I wondered if you could comment on that and also perhaps a little bit on... Uh, on the character of John Quincy Adams, uh, not to be palsied by the wills of our constituents, <laughs> uh, his interest in astronomy and so on. He seems to me to have been a very visionary president. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, I assume the parallel that you have in mind is that uh, Jimmy Carter was uh, limited to one term and was, like John Quincy Adams, unsuccessful uh, in his quest for a re-election and was succeeded by an immensely uh, popular and uh, charismatic individual much along the lines of Andrew Jackson allowing of course for the difference in time. Yes, that parallel has, uh, has occurred to me and it also uh, is similar to the difference or the relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson earlier in which again the first Adams was uh, denied re-election and succeeded by a more popular um, uh, individual and of course JQA himself. Um, I'm working on, a, on an essay, which I hope to complete sometime, um, that discusses that Adams-Jefferson and Adams-Jackson uh, relationship because the, the parallel goes beyond that. And as you probably know, with Adams and Jefferson, they were good friends uh, uh, for a long time, went their separate ways, ran against one another, and then uh, about 10 years after Adams's defeat, were reconciled through the mails, and we have that very rich correspondence between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson between 1812 and 1826. Uh, likewise, John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson were almost uh, part of a mutual admiration society prior to, their, to, to Adams's first candidacy. In fact, at one point, John Quincy Adams was the only member of President Monroe's cabinet to support Andrew Jackson's somewhat uh, aggressive uh, attack on Florida, in which he invaded a Spanish fort, executed a number of Indians, and hanged two Englishmen. Uh, something of an international uh, scandal was about to break out. But John Quincy Adams was one of the few people that defended Jackson, rightly or wrongly, for what he had done. Then when they became rivals, uh, they went their separate ways, just as the father had with Thomas Jefferson. But there the parallel stops, because you will recall that John Quincy Adams came back to Congress uh, and spent the rest of his career more or less in opposition to the Jacksonian Democrats, and the relationship between the two deteriorated rapidly. Uh, and was not friendly at all uh, toward the end. He was in the United States Senate for how long? Uh, Congress, uh, the House of Representatives. No, Senate. Uh, Adams was in the Senate from 1804 to 18, no, 1803 to 1807. Just and who years. put him there? He was elected by the Massachusetts legislature, uh, as senators were in those days. He was the president for how long? He was president for four years. And he was in the House of Representatives for how long? Uh, 14 years. Let's go to Albuquerque, New Mexico next. Go ahead, please. You're on with Len Parsons. Yes, good morning. Um, in the movie Amistad, uh, the attorneys for the slaves sought the counsel of John Quincy Adams. Could you comment on that, if that was historically accurate, and exactly what role that John Quincy Adams played in that incident? Thank you very right. much. A, a, a mild correction that they were not slaves. Uh, if they were slaves, there would have been no case. Uh, they were Africans who the courts determined had been kidnapped and therefore were returned to Africa. Yes, that is accurate. Uh, the the, the uh, abolition attorneys for the Africans of the Amistad did uh, uh, recruit John Quincy Adams. He did plead uh, their case before the Supreme Court, along with Mr. Baldwin of Connecticut, as you saw in the film. Um, I thought the character that uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins created for John Quincy Adams was extremely uh, accurate as far as the personality and his curmudgeonly um, uh, aspects there. The actual words and some of the scenes there, uh, we would have to say the directors and the script writers uh, took a great deal of advantage of what we'll have to call poetic license. How sick was John Quincy Adams in his life? I don't think he was any more uh, in, in ill health for anyone given that age. He was uh, our first presidential jogger. He was the first one to, uh, well, let me 
begin by saying the Adamses of that generation, father and son, had a tendency to put on weight, and they were aware of that. And so they did exercise, at least John Quincy Adams exercised, and he could be seen uh, in, in, in the as Secretary of State and as President uh, jogging around Washington. He uh, had a... Uh, how old is he in that picture there that we just And that saw? one, he's it's 72. That was taken uh, in, in his old age. I don't think he was jogging anymore at that point. But when he was 59 years old, he wrote in his diary that he could make it from the White House to the Capitol uh, and back in an hour flat, which uh, most presidents I don't think can do today. We're going to meet Celeste Walker in a few moments, but first we have a call from Leroy, New York. Go ahead, please. Hi, Dr. Parsons. This is Chris from your early Republic class. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are, you in, are you in Dr. Parsons' class now? Yes, I am. Yeah, first of all, I want to know, is this going to be on the exam? It could be, Chris. It could be. <laughs> uh, and, uh, second, Depends on your you, question. You, you know me well enough that uh, I don't, I don't uh, discount anything. <laughs> and it's got to be in a six-page paper, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> My question is, um, uh, John Quincy Adams' opposition to Indian removal, was that on uh, religious moral grounds, or was that just strictly in opposition to anything uh, that Jackson favored? <laughs> It didn't, uh, it didn't hurt that it was in opposition to anything that Jackson did. But as you, as you know, I have become convinced that as Adams, who started out with a fairly Jacksonian position uh, on Indians, uh, namely that they had no rights that white people were entitled to respect, uh, and that the Europeans had a better claim to the soil because they used it more efficiently than the allegedly hunting and nomad uh, habits of, of Indians. Uh, toward the end of his life, and I think next to his uh, anti-slavery positions uh, in the 1830s and 1840s, he became convinced that the American people were committing a, a grave injustice against, uh, the, uh, against the Indians on moral grounds uh, as well as uh, simple uh, uh, equity and decency. And so he, he took the position that, you, uh, that you're well aware of. Not far from here, if you want to visit these um, uh, major historical spots, is the, are the birthplaces of both John Quincy Adams and John Adams. We showed that in our second program. We have it on videotape now over in Quincy, Massachusetts. It used to be called Braintree. We'll show you those homes here, I hope, in just a moment. Uh, that's, and then we're, well, let's just take a call. That's, there they are on your screen. Let's go to Eureka, California next. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Good morning, Brian. Thank you for this series. I really appreciate it. I was calling regarding uh, John Quincy Adams and how pertinent uh, some of his advice as Secretary of the State uh, 177 years ago in that he cautioned that by intervention in the Balkans, America would involve herself beyond the power of extraction in all wars of interest and intrigue of individual advice, uh, avarice, envy and ambition, which assume the colors and usurps the standards of freedom. I thought this was quite pertinent, uh, and it, this is from uh, the uh, Washington Times, the February 1st through the 7th National Weekly Edition. I would like a comment from the professor. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's taken from uh, probably the most important oration that John Quincy Adams ever delivered on July 4th, 1821. And uh, the, the passage before that, uh, you, you may recall, he says, America does not go forth uh, in search of monsters to destroy. And every time uh, the United States has become involved uh, in a war uh, or military action in some other continent, uh, you can count on those p words being, uh, being, being quoted. If you're asking me what John Quincy Adams' attitude would be toward current events in the Balkans, I haven't a clue. But uh, certainly within the context of the 1820s, given the isolation that the United States uh, enjoyed or endured at that point, given the, uh, the, the distance in terms of, of communication, uh, there was no way in which John Quincy Adams, or I think any other president of that generation, uh, would countenance um, uh, involvement in a European war. In the 20th century, beginning with Woodrow Wilson, uh, things changed, and whether John Quincy Adams would have said in 1917, we are now a major power, we now have a capability of dealing with these things, and what I said in 1821 is no longer valid in 1917, or 1941, or 1950, or 1965, or 1999, I have no idea. Our guest, Professor Parsons, uh, got his master's from Johns Hopkins University in 1964, and then he got a Ph.D. in history in 67 from the same university. Any relationship between your name, Lynn Hudson Parsons, and your hometown of Lynn, Massachusetts? No, I was named after my grandfather, uh, uh, who was, in fact, uh, active in 
public affairs for a long time, uh, many years ago, and the interest that I have in public affairs, I, I sometimes subscribe to him. But that, uh, I don't think they named the town after him either. I, I think that's a coincidence. Any relationship between your wife, Ann Haruska Parsons, and Roman Haruska, the former senator from Nebraska? Yes, uh, she is uh, his uh, niece. Is he still alive? Yes, he is. How old a man I, is he? He uh, is a bit younger than Strong Thurmond. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I had... We had, we, yeah, we had lunch a couple, three years ago. Uh, we, we come from a different political persuasion, but he's always been very kind. Uh, Where does he live? He lives in Omaha, in Nebraska. Covington, Louisiana, for our guest. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, in reference to John Quincy Adams and also Andrew Jackson, that time period, uh, from me being in Louisiana and, of course, the Battle of New Orleans in 1814, uh, there's still a running debate for, for a lot of us down here historically as to whether or not if the British would have defeated uh, the U.S. troops in that battle, even though a treaty was signed, uh, would the British continue to take over aggressive action and control the Mississippi, which would control the western developing states, such that we possibly, to this day and time, would be with a British accent as we speak here. But could you just respond to that, and I'll listen to your answer. Thank you. Were the, were the British accent instead of a Cajun accent? Uh, uh, yes, that, that, that has always been pointed out, and I, it, again, there's no way that can be resolved. Uh, it's often been said that had there been a transatlantic cable back in uh, 1815, uh, with the news of the end of the war being transmitted to the United States overnight, that there would have been no battle and consequently no Andrew Jackson to uh, revere in later generations. But the, uh, the point is, is a valid one, that uh, if the British had won, it's not clear uh, that that treaty that uh, Adams had negotiated would have uh, required them to give up uh, the capture of uh, one of the major American cities at the time. Do you have any idea what he would have, John Quincy Adams would have sounded like? Uh, vaguely. He was not, in spite of uh, the fact that he was referred to as old man eloquent, which I think is a quotation from a poem by Milton, um, he was not a great orator in the Daniel Webster uh, sense, or even in the sense that his father was a great orator. The, Accounts that I have read suggest that he had a rather uh, high-pitched, uh, occasionally grating voice, particularly if you didn't agree with what he was saying. How tall was he? He was 5'7", uh, 5'8". Five, uh, five, uh, and how much his... time did he spend at the Adams house over in Quincy? He spent uh, uh, most of his life there uh, from the time when uh, John Adams died in July 4th, 1826. Uh, he spent his summers there most of the time, and then, of course, winters uh, in Washington at 4 and a half F Street, uh, which was his house at that time. Who were his best friends? <laughs> his best friends. Um, his wife, I think, possibly. Uh, his, his, um, we need to talk about her. Uh, he, the, the Everett brothers, uh, Edward Everett, uh, best known for being the other uh, speaker at Gettysburg. The hour and 59-minute speech? Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, he was very close to uh, Edward and his uh, older brother, uh, Alexander Everett, uh, and the diary indicates uh, considerable uh, uh, conversations and correspondence with them. But you put your, your finger on a question I never really have thought about before. I don't think he had close friends. He was not that kind of person. He had people respected him, people admired him, uh, but there weren't too many people that loved him. And we're going to find out this later firsthand, but where did he die? He died uh, uh, in the uh, House of Representatives chamber, which is now Statuary Hall in Washington. Uh, there is a disc on the floor there that marks the spot, and then he actually he was stricken there and carried into the next room and died there two years, uh, two two days later. And of course, for our audience, anybody that's ever visited the Capitol and gone on the tour, you remember the whisper room where they stand on other sides of the room. You can hear people whispering. That's that's where we're going to go later. Newburyport, Massachusetts. You'll meet Celeste Walker right after this call. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Brian. Morning. And uh, I'm from Newburyport, and uh, I have uh, found in the local library an abridged version of the diary of uh, John Quincy Adams, edited by Alan Nevins. And I was looking through it yesterday, and there was a, in the chronology of his life, there's a note that uh, after he graduated from Harvard that he studied law in Newburyport with a gentleman named Theophilus Parsons, who later became Chief Justice of Massachusetts. And I was wondering if your guest could uh, comment on uh, that period of his, of his early life. I thought you were going to ask if I was related to Theophilus Parsons, and, I, and the answer to that is I'm not sure. Uh, 
First of all, what you want to do is get the, uh, not the Alan Nevins uh, uh, edition of the John Quincy Adams diary, but the first two volumes of the diary which were published by the Massachusetts Historical Society at some point in the 1980s because they go into great detail, or the diary goes into great detail, about uh, John Quincy Adams' uh, life in Newburyport, his relationships with the young women of uh, Newburyport, and his studying law, yes, with uh, Theophilus Parsons, who was the uh, next to John Adams himself, I suppose, the outstanding legal uh, authority in Massachusetts. In those days, as you know, you didn't go to law school. It was more like an apprentice relationship, and you spent maybe a year or two in the office of a well-known attorney who, after the end of that period, would present you before the court and certify that you knew what you were doing and uh, practice law from that. How old was John Quincy Adams when he died? He was uh, in his 81st year. And when do you think he was the happiest? I think he was, <laughs> I think he was the happiest uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives presenting petitions on behalf of the anti-slavery cause and being squelched over and over again by the, uh, by the pro-slavery uh, people and their northern allies. Did he ever own slaves? No, he did not. Celeste Walker is the associate editor of the Adams Papers. She is here at the Massachusetts Historical Society today, and she's going to tell us all about why she is so interested in this subject. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Uh, as you can see, I'm surrounded by volumes of the diary here. Uh, John Quincy Adams kept his diary for over 65 years. He kept it unbroken entries uh, for 26 years. That means that he wrote in the diary every single day. Now I have here in front of me the first volume of his diary. Uh, here's the title page. It says a journal, a journal by me, JQA. What year? 1779. He was 12 years old. Uh, he was about ready to leave for Europe for the second time with his father and this booklet next to it shows the drawings of two ships as you can see the frightful and the horrid uh, john quincy adams was a little boy uh, a lot of people don't think of him that way but he started out young and you can see where he had his imagination now th this is the actual this paper is, and pen and it's the, this is the actual diary here is the first entry and right around you in those boxes are the entire works absolutely how and and have you read all those no how, how much of it have you read well i'm editing right now uh, volumes three and four of the diary so we're very much into that uh and as uh professor parsons we dip into the diary as we need to could you just open up one of them just to show everybody how they're stored and, and, and we can go back to it later, whatever you want to do. Just, sure. Are these, who makes these boxes, by the way? These boxes were made uh, to hold the diaries. Uh, they were made by the Historical Society. Right here? Not right here. They were measured and made outside. I think they came from Scotland. And that, who binds them? Like what you, what we're this looking. is the original binding. Did he do it himself? I mean, did he have it done when, back then? I, I think he did. This is a kind of vellum. It says diary on it. It has the dates stamped, 1795. And if I open it up, you can see... Tiny little... Handwriting. Handwriting. And Perfectly straight. Mostly very readable. very readable. Always the same. Very few cross-outs. Does the uh, what, what kind of language? What kind of you know? Uh, how, how well was it written? It was. It, it's very readable. Uh, the character of the diary is very much so that he will discuss personal things, but he does not really discuss what conversation went into making the personal de decisions. And you say he did it every day for at least 26 years? 26 years, not a day missing. And then a total of how many days do you think over his whole life did he write a diary? Uh, well, the diary spans 68 years. I think it's probably in the 50 year, enough entries for 50 to 60 years. Stay there, uh, obviously. We'll come right back. We've got okay. a call waiting in Inkster, Michigan. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. 
Hello, Angster. Good morning, all. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, I had a quick question concerning uh, uh, John Quincy Adams' uh, religious beliefs and those of his peers. I'm told that the Unitarian Church and the Freemasons had quite an uh, influence over the early period of our country. Thanks for the call. Professor the, uh, Parsons? John Quincy Adams did not join a church uh, until after his father's death in 1826 when he joined the uh, first parish church in Quincy that we just uh, saw the film clips of it, which was at the time and still is a Unitarian church. And therefore, he is one of the half dozen or so presidents that the Unitarians uh, will claim. But that did not mean that he was indifferent to religion because his diary, uh, as Celeste could, could tell you, uh, contains uh, almost every Sunday uh, the record of the church service that he attended. Sometimes he attended two, and an analysis of the sermon, whether he agreed with it or not or so on. Uh, so he was very much uh, interested in religion. Uh, he uh, became, uh, in, in, the, in his latter years, in, the, in, the, in his 70s, he was president for a long time of the American Bible Society. He was perhaps uh, the most learned of all our presidents uh, on the Bible and its teachings and its various interpretations. I would have to describe him as a, something of a conservative Unitarian because he, uh, he took the Bible quite seriously. He didn't uh, treat it as a, a fundamental, as a fundamentalist would, but he was inspired by it. He was familiar with it. Um, he accepted the uh, probability of the divinity of Jesus. He believed in an afterlife. These are things that Unitarians today probably would have some reservations about. Scaffolding you see on the screen from the church is uh, where the church is under repair. And you saw Pew 54. Was that the pew, do I remember, remember correct, that uh, John Adams used to sit in? That, the, that's the my understanding, yes. Yeah. Walnut Creek, California, you're next. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'm enjoying the show. I'm proud to say I grew up in Quincy, Massachusetts. And I did my high school study on the friendship between John Adams and Jefferson. And and actually evolved my lifelong stance that life is long because they did mend their differences and I think they both died on the same day. Yes, they did. The father. Um, but um, does anybody know, I remember it as being brain tree and we were told uh, babies were brained on those trees and that's where the name came from. And did they change the name to Quincy because of the Adams family or which came first? The name, uh, first of all, I don't think that's the accurate the origin of the term. I think it comes from a, a town in, in, uh, in uh, London, oh, I'm sorry, in England, with that same name. It was changed, uh, uh, actually, Braintree is still there. It's the north parish of Braintree that was changed to Quincy, probably in recognition of uh, the first John Quincy, who was John Quincy Adams' grandfather, and the long role that he had played, well, the Quincy family in, generally, in general uh, played in, the, uh, in Massachusetts affairs. Uh, so it was just kind of a legal change from that North Parish that became now the town of Quincy, as opposed to Braintree, which uh, remained that way for the rest of the uh, rest of the area. In the other room uh, from where we are in Ellis Hall is uh, Celeste Walker, who is pure Massachusetts. She was born in Marlboro, Massachusetts. She uh, went to school at Newton, Massachusetts, the um, Newton College of the Sacred Heart. And um, the, I, I asked you earlier, and we didn't get to it, but how did you start... When did you first get interested in, in being an editor of the Adams Papers? Well, I was very fortunate. Uh, the summer after I graduated from college, the Adams Papers was looking for an editorial assistant, and they had an editorial assistant at the time who had graduated from Newton College. So I heard about the opening, and I came in, and I was fortunate enough to get the job and start working with Lyman Butterfield, who was the first editor-in-chief of the Adams Papers. Now, if someone comes to the library here, and we learned from uh, Bill Fowler earlier that you can come here, it doesn't cost you any money, you can use this place. Can you put your hands on those diaries that are behind you? If you come to read the Adams Papers, you'll see them on microfilm. Uh, part of this is for preservation, part of this is for security. If there's trouble reading the volumes, of course, uh, we help people out with the originals. You want to show us something else that you have there on the table? Yes, uh, I have here, and this is back, going back to John Quincy Adams' diary, where it looked like as a mature man. And this is when he heard about the news of his mother's death. His mother had been very sick in 1818, and he had spent about six weeks at home in the fall. Now, he was negotiating uh, a very important treaty. 
he had to get back to Washington. Uh, he heard about her death a couple days after she died. And he writes in his diary the feelings uh, his father had for his mother and his admiration of his mother. And he starts here, she had been 54 years the delight of my father's heart, the sweetener of all his toils, the comforter of all his sorrows, the sharer and heightener of all his joys. And the last time he saw his father, he said, he told him, and this is John Adams telling John Quincy Adams, that in all the vicissitudes of his fortunes, through all the good report and evil report of the world, in all his struggles and in all his sorrows, the affectionate participation and cheering encouragement of his wife had been his never failing support, without which he was sure he could never have lived through them. Now, she died in 1818 and he died in 1826. Do yes. either one of you know what uh, John Quincy Adams' uh, life was like after his mother died, or even John Adams, who lived, I mean, I, I, John Quincy Adams didn't die until many years later, but uh, Abigail Adams' husband lived another eight years. Eight years. What yeah. was his life like without her? His, his house was filled with um, children. His uh, son, Thomas Boylston Adams, who had seven children, and Thomas Boylston Adams' his wife lived with John Adams. Uh, as well, I think, um, another granddaughter and her children, her two daughters, were living in the house. So there were quite a few people in the house, which at that time wasn't as big as it is now. If you've just joined us, we are in uh, our sixth of 41 programs devoted to the 41 men who were president of the United States. It goes on throughout the rest of the year. All of these programs are repeated every Friday night, East Coast time at 8 o'clock. For those of you who can't watch them live, the live programs are done today. is the only one we do on a Sunday. They're done on Mondays and Fridays usually. And uh, we have uh, an education department that is uh, ready to help you if you're a teacher. Use these materials in your classroom. We'll give you a telephone number, as you can see on the screen, 202-626-4858. And the website, cspan.org slash classroom. Those two addresses and phone numbers will get you to our education department. Joanne Wheeler and her team are there to uh, take your calls this morning. If you're watching this live, we'll send you materials, enroll you in C-SPAN the classroom, all at no charge. Professor Parsons, you want to make just, a point? Just to point out that the Adams Mansion will be open uh, tomorrow on Patriot's Day uh, to receive its usual onslaught of visitors at this time, probably more in view of this program. So if you're watching it live, it will be April. I'm, I haven't got the date in front of me. 19th. April 19th. And we go to Busti, New York next. Go ahead, please. On your screen, by the way, is the home where both John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, lived and many others in the family. Go ahead, please. Morning, Brian and Professor. It's a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Welcome. It's a pleasure I to be here. I enjoyed your series very much, Brian. I am a, uh, I am a Mason. I am the master of the Justice Robert H. Jackson Lodge of Research in western New York, and I have a book uh, written by John Quincy Adams, Freemasonry by John Quincy Adams. And I was wondering what the uh, professor, whether he'd read that book or, or not, and what his opinion of uh, uh, John Quincy Adams' rabid uh, anti-Masonic <laughs> stand was. Right. And I have another question when he's done, if, if possible. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I have not read it, but I am familiar with it, uh, as you know, uh, in... My part of the country now, western New York State, there uh, erupted in the late 1820s uh, a furious uh, campaign against uh, the Masonic Order on a variety of charges having to do with being a secret society and, and undermining the, allegedly undermining the principles of Republican government. And John Quincy Adams, uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, uh, latched onto that and for the next five or six years became part of and a supporter of the anti-Mason party, the anti-Masonry movement, movement, and even, I think, contemplated and would have accepted a presidential nomination in 1832 from the anti-Masonic party had it come his way. It did not, as you know. Uh, he ran for governor of Massachusetts in 1833 on an anti-Masonic ticket uh, and came in, I believe, second in that particular race. 
Uh, where his animus against uh, the Masons comes from, I'm not sure, other than that he accepted the argument, which you know was uh, prevalent in many parts of the country, particularly in the North, that as a secret organization, uh, it was incompatible uh, with true Republican, as they would have said in those days, government. Follow-up question, sir? The uh, follow-up question is uh, President Grant, his uh, uh, God-given name was uh, uh, Hiram Ulysses Grant, and uh, the story goes that his name had to be changed to uh, Ulysses Simpson Grant in order for him to gain admission into West Point, and that John Quincy Adams being in Congress at the time of his appointment was the reason for that name change. And I wonder if the professor could comment on that. That's, uh, I knew about the name change, but I did not know about the connection with uh, J.Q. Adams. I'll have to check into that. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Celeste Walker, from reading the diaries of John Quincy Adams, what kind of a person comes through just from the diaries? Just from the diaries. I think what you see from the diaries is how much he was alone, how much he wasn't at home. He left home um, first time at the age of nine. He was in Europe, went back at age 12. He spent a lot of time without his mother, his sister. Uh, when his family reunited in France, he was, came back here to go to school. And then, as they were talking before, he was in Newburyport. So I don't think John Quincy Adams ever had the hometown ever had the feeling that there was one spot where he truly belonged, where the people were his friends. The Hatchapi, California, next. Go ahead, please. Yes, this is John Clausen. Uh, I'd like to ask a question of Celeste Walker, but first I'd like to thank Brian very, very much for this program. It's wonderful. I'm 89, uh, renewing my studies, even through using a computer uh, <laughs> but I want to ask Celeste Walker if uh, she has a record in his, uh, if he recorded his feeling while he was president, he knew there was going to be a civil war. He was very certain. And when did he express himself that? I know afterwards in the 11 years in the House of Representatives, he never quit. 11 years in the House of Representatives, he never quit talking about abolition. My interest is because I'm a direct descendant of old John Brown, the abolitionist. And many of the family are buried here in Pasadena. And uh, my uncle is buried up on the side of Brown Mountain above the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, in case people don't know that generally. Where, where it, you, John Brown is buried there? No. Or, no, no. Your uncle is. Oh, Where's no, John? My great uncle Owen Brown. He was where in is... Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Uh, there when uh, during the problems with uh, the raid on Harper's Ferry. And thanks for calling. Okay, thanks. We're going to uh, let Celeste Walker answer that. Go ahead, please. I think what you see in the diary is he does know that, well, he fears there may be a civil war. He doesn't think the country, and here's someone who was living before the country was really founded, he doesn't think that the country can withstand something like this. And so this is the problem. How do you find a solution to slavery without splitting the country apart? So I think it was probably, even though he may have thought it was inevitable, it was his hope that something could happen so this would not happen. We're going to meet Peter Byrd in just a second, who is in the United States Capitol, and we'll talk to him about Statuary Hall, where the House of Representatives used to meet. Uh, Professor Parsons? Comment on the last question. Um, at the time of the Missouri debates in 1820 and 1821, uh, this was when he was Secretary of State, uh, John Quincy Adams followed them very closely. I think he went over to uh, the, the Senate and the House chamber to watch. And he said, uh, when he came back after one of the sessions, he said, this is the title page to a tragic volume. So he sensed that there was, this could have no happy outcome, even, even before he became president. Hartford, Connecticut, you're next. Good morning, Brian, and thank you for C-SPAN. I'm sorry I have laryngitis this morning. Um, I'm curious about the relationship between Adams, John Quincy Adams' personality and the fact that he got elected to so many things. <laughs> uh, was campaigning different? Uh, did people make their decisions based on different criteria? Uh, I wonder what the professor might have to offer about that. Thank you. 
All right, thanks. But let me go back to the actual uh, statistics on when he was elected president. Um, what did he, you know, break it In down? In 1824? Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten the exact uh, numbers, but uh, Andrew Jackson uh, got more popular votes than he did. By uh, several percentage points, like uh, two or three percentage Yes, points. yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, not exactly a landslide, but it was, it was persuasive. Got more electoral votes, too. And got more electoral votes, but the Constitution then and now, as a matter of fact, states that uh, you become president only if you have a majority of the electoral votes. And that's what threw it into the House of Representatives, whereas it turned out uh, John Quincy Adams had more friends than uh, Andrew Jackson did uh, and put him in the presidency. Uh, I mean, if the fourth on that list was Henry Clay, who went on to be Secretary of State for John Quincy Adams. Right. Uh, was the, there a the deal? Rule, there's, a, there's a anecdote there, too. But the, the rule at that time was the top three uh, are, you choose from. And Henry Clay was fourth, so he didn't make it. Uh, into the uh, in, into the pool. If he had made it, he conceivably would have been elected president over all of the others. But the other two candidates were William Crawford, who was ill and incapacitated, having suffered a mild cerebral hemorrhage, and Andrew Jackson. Uh, and uh, Henry Clay, although he could not be president as Speaker of the House, uh, had a good deal of influence over how the House of Representatives voted and uh, tipped uh, the balance toward uh, John Quincy Adams in what became known ever afterwards as the corrupt bargain. How many electoral votes did uh, John Quincy Adams get when he ran in 1828? I don't recall. I don't recall the account, but there was uh, uh, that was uh, uh, a clear-cut victory for Jackson. There was no putting that in the House of Representatives. There wasn't any question that the no, public did not no, want him no. to serve. Jackson got about 54 percent of the popular vote. I've, I've forgotten the electoral count. And when he won, and back to our caller's question, but when he won the United States Senate uh, situation. How difficult was that for him to win this, uh, the legislature vote here? Um, this would have been back in 1803, 1804. That uh, was not something that the popular masses had any say in. It was the legislature that elected him. But the, the, the caller makes a good point in, in that Adams did not have a, he, he was an introverted, uh, I think probably we would call him a type A personality today. He was very driven. He was not, he was uncomfortable in crowds. He would not be considered seriously as a presidential candidate today at all because he really didn't campaign in those days. His model, his, his, his role model was not his father, uh, but George Washington, who did not campaign for office either. And it always was his regret, I think, that the office did not come to him the way it had come to George Washington. He didn't realize, of course, there could only be one George Washington. If you've just joined us, we're at the Massachusetts Historical Society headquarters in Boston, Massachusetts on Boylston Street. Picture on your screen right there, our camera outside. Our bus sits alongside Massachusetts Historical Society. We're not very far away from Fenway Park, those of you who are sports fans, and not too far away from the Prudential Center, which is right down that street. Uh, those of you familiar with this area. We have uh, Peter Bird, who is United States Capitol Guide Service tour guide with us this morning. There's a picture of the Capitol. He's on the other side of that in Statuary Hall. Hello, Peter Bird. Good morning, Brian. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you this morning? Very well. Where are you? Uh, right now I'm in National Statuary Hall, which is in the original south wing of the Capitol, just to the south side of the Great Rotunda under the dome. We might as well go right to it because I know you've told the story hundreds of thousands of times. What's the whisper story? Uh, the whisper story, uh, which I will preface by saying is an apocryphal folk story, uh, concerns the fact that the acoustics of the room are, are influenced by the unusual shape of the ceiling. Perhaps the cameraman could pan and look up at the ceiling just to show the, the unusual shape there. It allows for uh, the sound to bounce off the floor on one side of the room, reflect off the ceiling, and then over to the other side. Uh, interestingly, when the house actually met here, there was a wooden floor and a wooden ceiling in place. And the whisper actually worked through the whole room, not just from the few spots as we think of it today. Uh, most important was putting up a, a cast steel ceiling right at the turn of the last century for fireproofing reasons that left this uh, whisper just working in a few spots. And of course, what makes it so famous for everyone is the fact that one of those spots was where John Quincy Adams' desk was located during at least some of those 17 years that he served here in the house. Where in that room did he collapse? He collapsed at his desk, which from here I'm going to point over to the other side of the room. Um, there's 
It's out in a space that has only a plate on the floor. From here, we wouldn't be able to see it. Well, in fact, there's a lady walking over there. Let's, she's standing on the spot now. How about that? So the lady there with the green tag is standing on the spot where Adam's desk was, and that was the point where he collapsed right at his desk there. Where did they take him after that? Uh, from there, they carried him, and we can point over this way now. There's a, a door over to the side here that at the time was the entrance into the speaker's office. Let uh, me just tell our audience that the desk was on the screen uh, just a few moments ago, and that's located over at the Stone Library next to the Adams Mansion in Quincy. And on our screen right now is near the door where he was taken. Go ahead with your story. I'm sorry, right. uh, Mr. Burke. Well, no, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, uh, the door there again goes right in, into a little hallway that goes back to, to where the speaker's formal space was. And there was a couch in there. Adams was placed on the couch and uh, died two days later. The, interestingly, the, the, his uh, stroke was on the day before Washington's birthday on February 21st, and he was in his coma throughout uh, Washington's birthday and then died on the, the 23rd. The entire time he served in the House was how many years? 17, 1831 and to 1848. How much of it was in that room? Oh, that was the entire time here. What was Congress like then? I, I, could you be more specific? What, what was con what, well in that era? What kind of an atmosphere was it compared to what we see today? How big was it? How many members mm, were I see, there? I see. Uh, well, compared to today, significantly less. Uh, until early in the 20th century, after each census, as the the population increased, they simply increased the number of members for the House of Representatives. When uh, people come on a tour today, there, how many of them know anything about Qu John Quincy Adams? The thing that we find that people know about him, interestingly, is that they're, they're expecting to, to play with the whisper spot that we were just talking about. Um, most people know that he was the sixth president of the United States. Um, most people know his father, John Adams, had been president as well. I, I don't find that too many folks really know the details of his time as a member of the House. Uh, until the Amistad movie came out the other year, people were totally unfamiliar with, with his work arguing that case uh, and in terms of his time in the Senate or as an ambassador that that's pretty unknown as well stay where you are just a moment if you would I need to take a call here from San Diego California joining us this morning go ahead please you know it's interesting that I had met somebody out here there <clears throat> that uh, was had been married to one of John Adams great 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 grandsons and he had been killed in World War World War II and I was wondering if your uh, author had any contact with any of uh, that line or that uh, relative. Let me start with Celeste Walker to ask her if uh, many of the relatives come by here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Well, actually, we get quite a few inquiries um, for geneal genealogy. The first Henry Adams that came to this country had seven sons. And so John Adams and John Quincy Adams are descended from this Henry Adams. So. There are many cousins, many collateral relatives, and the Adams family themselves in the presidential line is quite large. Peter Bird, do you ever meet any ancestors? It's interesting because over the years I have met a number of folks who are related to folks either in the statuary in the building or famous members of the House or Senate, but I can't think of anyone off the cuff related to Adams. How did you get into this business, by the way, of being a tour guide there at uh, the Capitol? Well, I, I studied history. Uh, University of North Carolina, um, so I, and I grew up in a historically minded family. I had, uh, gosh, I had seven ancestors who came on the Mayflower. One of my uh, gr fifth great grandfathers died at the Battle of Saratoga in the Revolution. Someday I'll be buried 150 yards from two of the signers of the Declaration of Independence in our family plot. So history was in the family. And uh, after college, I always thought it'd be fun to be a tour guide, and, and it gives me a chance to teach people, to do research, to, to be in the big league, so to speak, where so much of the history has happened. I have the best classroom in the world for teaching visitors. Peter Bird, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Professor Parsons. You were going to say something about the... A word sentence. about the, uh, the death of uh, John Quincy Adams uh, in, in 1848. Uh, after the ceremonies which were held in the Capitol, uh, his body was taken back uh, to Quincy by train, uh, stopping at uh, most of the major cities along the East Coast, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Springfield, Boston, and so forth. And that was the first time that that had ever been done. 
Uh, it was also what I've called a, a media event in that uh, it took place in 1848, and by that time most of the major cities on the, on the East Coast were connected by telegraph. So whereas if that had happened, say, five years before, it would have taken two or three days, maybe a week, for the news to reach Boston. Uh, this time it only took uh, an hour or so for the whole East Coast to know that John Quincy Adams had passed on. And that meant it was possible to organize um, a, a funeral procession uh, by rail uh, all the way from Washington to Boston. That's the first time that that, that, had, had, uh, that, that had ever uh, happened. Our next live telecast of a president will be stop number seven with Andrew Jackson at the Hermitage right outside of Nashville. It's about 12 miles outside the, the, uh, the city and it's be on April the 26th at 9 a.m. when we do it live. Of course, it's repeated every Friday night. Houston, Texas, our next call. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. All right. Um, was Ty which, um, which president was Tyler. Was he the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth? Which one? Who, John Tyler? Tyler. Tyler. Um, how old are you? Seven. Seven years old. Do, do we get a prize if we answer it correctly? I think it was the tenth president. Do you know that caller? Houston? What is your name? Alicia. Alicia? Alicia. Why are you watching this this morning? With my mom. And you, are you studying the presidents? Yes. Who's your favorite president? Um, Tyler. Why? Because, um, I don't know. That's a good answer. Thank you for joining us. Let's go to Quincy, Massachusetts next. Go ahead, please. Yes, Brian, I have uh, two quick questions for the professor. I live in the section of Quincy called Howe's Neck, and um, John Quincy Adams was the third Commodore of a yacht club, Quincy Yacht Club, from 1880 to 1881 down here. Another question is um, the connection with the Quincy Public Schools. I believe at one time the public school system turned over some minutes of a school committee meeting to the Quincy Historical Society. And I believe either uh, John Quincy or his father had something to do with that. Thank you. The John Quincy Adams that was the Commodore of the Yacht Club in the 1880s, of course, uh, I think was uh, a grandson of, uh, of the President, John Quincy Adams. Um, and yes, the, the, uh, the public school system in Quincy, I think, got a strong boost. I think it was from John Adams, not from John Quincy Adams, in the, uh, in, in the uh, dedication and the donation that, that you refer. They, they uh, were very strong supporters of public education, as indeed I think were most of the New England culture at that time. And in so doing so, they were quite typical. Celeste Walker, uh, in those diaries, uh, how much of the trips that he took from, what was it, uh, was he 14 years old when he was in Russia? Mm -hmm. How much of that's in the diaries? He, his first trip to Russia was uh, probably not a happy time for him. Uh, he was with Francis Dana, who was trying to uh, establish diplomatic relations with between Russia and the United States and so they were not part of any real circle uh, he it's very funny every morning he records in his diary what the temperature was uh, and then you come to one day and he says my thermometer is broken we well, don't get the temperature anymore but it's the same thing he walks he talks to a few Americans, uh, but it's, it's kind of a boring time for him. Of Noth all? Nothing like the second time. When, uh, when do you see the diary really getting interesting? I think you get, well, his Harvard years are very interesting as a young man. He has very full entries over about two years. He, at one point, writes a sketch of each one of his classmates and, and talks about them and where they're from and what they like to do and uh, how he thinks they are as a person. Uh, one, in fact, he annotated later saying that he was wrong on one point. By the way, if you've just joined us, right behind Celeste Walker's um, head are the uh, John Quincy Adams diaries in those boxes back there. What else is on the shelf? We always, callers want to know, and if we could, we might look around this entire room at some point so they can see uh, what is the room that uh, you're sitting in. Uh, this room is called the Saltonstall room. It's uh, next to the room you're in, Alice Hall, and this is the reading room. Uh, 
this is the catalog room. If you were coming to the Massachusetts Historical Society, you would start and you would look in the catalogs over here. There are book catalogs, manuscript catalogs, to find what things you wanted to consult while you were here. The uh, books around me are the reference book collection. They are the books most commonly asked for, and people can come here and take them off the shelf and use them at this very table where I'm sitting. Seattle, Washington, next call. Go ahead, please. Seattle, you're on the air. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Fifty years ago, I did a dissertation on Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. Caller, I'm going to have to ask you to turn your television set volume down so that we can not get the feedback, but then go ahead. In his first appearance in the House of Representatives in 1846 or 48, Jefferson Davis was observed by John Quincy Adams then in his last years as a member of Congress. And the story goes that Adams recorded in his diary of Jefferson Davis, quote, that young man will make his mark. I'm wondering if there's anything further regarding Adams' opinions or knowledge of Jefferson Davis in the few years that they overlapped. And I just I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I, I am aware of the fact that, uh, as you probably know, John Quincy Adams had a long-term relationship with John C. Calhoun. Uh, whom he admired greatly uh, for his intellect, uh, his range of, uh, of, of background. Of course, Calhoun was educated in Ye at Yale University, which is almost as good as being educated at Harvard for Adams. But he had enormous respect for his intellect. He uh, increasingly found himself at odds with Calhoun on a range of political issues, as I'm sure you know, and that would have been the case with Jefferson Davis. But uh, I, I was unaware that the careers overlapped and it's quite possible that he could have made that observation. By the way, this series will go on throughout the rest of the year. It doesn't really end until December the 20th with Bill Clinton. 41 presidents, 42 presidencies. Grover Cleveland had an interrupted term where he was defeated by Benjamin Harrison. And, uh, yes, Professor? Could I say something about the diary in, in general? Uh, it was not unusual for people of that background, that New England background with its Puritan antecedents, uh, to keep diaries. It was a form, uh, it was a way of uh, maintaining self-introspection uh, and, and uh, keeping a, 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 a focus on one's own uh, inner self. A Catholic friend of mine many years ago pointed out that, uh, that uh, this was the equivalent of confession for Protestants. Uh, and what's unusual about the, uh, the Adams diary, of course, as Celeste knows, is, is its length and its, uh, and its detail. But uh, there were lots and lots of diaries kept by uh, Yankees uh, in the 18th and early 19th centuries as part of that tradition. Producer of this program here with us, Maura Pierce, director Brett Betzel in Washington, Paul Brown, and Maurice Haynes there on the controls. Bethesda, Maryland, for our next call. Go ahead, please. Hello, Bethesda. This is Delaware. Where in Delaware? Uh, Newark, Delaware. Welcome. Go ahead and please turn down your volume. Okay, thank you. I have a question for the professor. It seems that in talking about the other past presidents, many of them owned slaves. Um, do you know if John Quincy Adams, if any of his family owned slaves, and why was it possible for him to be, I guess, prosperous without having owned slaves? Neither of the Adamses, uh, uh, either father or son, uh, owned slaves. Uh, the slave population of uh, of New England at that time was very small. Uh, the economy, the society, the, uh, the, the culture was something that never really was particularly comfortable with it. Some of the most uh, strident uh, anti-slavery statements that I recall any Adams uh, ever making uh, were made by Abigail Adams. Uh, they employed uh, free uh, black uh, servants from time to time. But uh, at no point uh, did uh, slavery play a significant part in the uh, culture or uh, economy of New England, and the Adamses just followed suit in that direction. Celeste Walker, what does an editor do of uh, papers like the Adams paper? Well, we call ourselves documentary editors, and we're not editors in the sense that we cross anything out. What we do is we try and uh, make an accurate transcription of the documents, of the diaries, of the letters, write explanatory footnotes, and we publish the volumes. We've published 36 volumes to date. What else can you show us there this morning? 
What I have here is a journal of Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. In 1815, when he concluded the Treaty of Ghent, he went to Paris, and Louisa Catherine had stayed in Russia with young Charles Francis Adams, who was about eight years old. John Quincy Adams asked her to close up the house in Russia, ship the books home, and come and meet him in Paris. This was in uh, January 1815. Uh, she did this. She did this essentially by herself with the help of uh, the people that she employed. And she came along with, in a carriage, across uh, from St. Petersburg to Paris in the middle of the winter, essentially. Uh, what she did, what she didn't know, what John Quincy Adams didn't know, is uh, it was Napoleon's comeback. She's riding in a big Russian coach with six horses, and she's approaching Paris. And she later wrote this all down, I think, really for her son and her grandchildren to write. But she writes that they're approaching Paris, and they come across Napoleon's army um, marching back. And the, the army, and uh, more specifically the camp followers, uh, weren't thinking too kindly of Russians at this time after Napoleon's defeat. And so it was becoming very clear that it was dangerous for her in this carriage. She showed her passport to the soldiers immediately. And she writes, at which point the soldiers shouted, long live the Americans, vive les, les Américains, and asked her to shout back, vive Napoleon, long live Napoleon. So she waved her white handkerchief, and every time the soldiers gave her the sign, she yelled, long live Napoleon. Uh, she, the th people came over to her side, and she was able to proceed and meet her husband in Paris without any problems. Chicago, Illinois, you're next. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank you, um, C-SPAN, for this excellent series, and once again, a very informative show. Um, my question for the professor is, is earlier reference to the uh, corrupt bargain uh, related to the uh, election of 1824. I know there's been some speculation that Adams may have arranged maybe a special deal with Henry Clay to gain support of the, the House of Representatives, and I understand this really hurt him um, going into his presidency. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, is there any historical evidence that this actually happened, or were there perhaps other circumstances that may have um, really um, affected the, the vote? Um, and secondly, I was wondering if the professor could please describe the relationship between um, Henry Clay and John, and John Quincy Adams. Uh, it would seem that Clay as a Westerner and, and Adams as a New Englander may have had uh, very different political goals, um, but, I, but I understand that they uh, eventually became very close allies, and I was wondering how the relationship might have changed uh, between the two, um, the two leaders before and after Adams' presidency. Thank you. Let me take the first question first. I, I know of no biographer of Andrew Jackson uh, in the 20th century or even in the late 19th century that subscribes to the notion that there was a uh, illicit arrangement between Adams and Clay uh, that resulted in Adams's election. Indeed, I think uh, even Martin Van Buren, who was a, a, a protege of Andrew Jackson, of course, succeeded him as president in his autobiography, specifically disclaimed uh, any, any belief that that had been the case. But as we tell our students uh, in our history courses in college, very often what people believe to be the case is more important than what really is the case. And during uh, uh, Adams' single term as president, that charge was repeated over and over and over again and certainly did contribute, although I don't think it was the deciding factor in his defeat. As for the relationship between Adams and Clay, uh, you're right. Uh, as a Westerner, Clay had different points of view than Adams did. Uh, from New England. This came out particularly when they both were in Belgium in 1814 negotiating the end of the, uh, uh, the War of 1812 and Henry Clay had his eye on the Mississippi and John Quincy Adams had his eye on the fisheries off the coast of Newfoundland and there was a gap in their, in their interest there to say the least and the rivalry, the opposition went on uh, during Adams' role as Secretary of State in which Henry Clay was a constant critic, particularly of Adams's reluctance to recognize the uh, independence of the Latin American republics before he thought it was appropriate to do it. But by the time 
Adams was a candidate for president and Clay was no longer eligible for the reason that I gave before, they had come around to uh, an accommodation. They had one thing in common, and that is that both Adams and Clay believed uh, that the purpose of the federal charter, the federal the Constitution, the powers given to Congress, was an active one to improve society, to build roads, to build canals, to sponsor uh, educational projects, to build a national university, to create a naval academy, uh, and ultimately things like the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and because they had that common point of view, and because Henry Clay was determined to prevent Andrew Jackson from becoming president, if he possibly could, they formed uh, this alliance. But as a, a quid pro quo arrangement, uh, anybody who knows anything about John Quincy Adams' integrity would, would reject that. And as I said, all of the Jackson biographers uh, of the 20th century have also rejected it. There's a lot to visit um, here in the Massachusetts, Boston area about the Adams family, including their birthplaces over in Quincy, Massachusetts, both the father and the son, second president of the United States and the sixth president of the United States, also the church where they uh, went to church often. You can see there on the screen, it's only about 20 minutes from downtown Boston to drive over there. And uh, we showed the church earlier where the crypt has been closed, at least for the time being. It sounded like uh, from our guest uh, that we had on the air here that the church won't be closed for that long. He gave the impression that maybe from six to uh, seven weeks. He certainly is hopeful. Uh, and he needs, I guess, $41,000. That's Reverend Sheldon Bennett. He told us he needed $41,000 in order to op open the crypt back up. The church is open, however, and that's the first parish church right there on the main street in um, Quincy, Massachusetts. And, of course, as we learned earlier, this Massachusetts Historical Society is open. You can come visit. You can read the, the papers here and the transcripts. Uh, Bill Fowler, who's the director of the Massachusetts Historical Society, was with us earlier. On your screen right now is the crypt. There's a live picture of the... Massachusetts Historical Society. Our call is from Boxford, Mass. Go ahead, please. What's your question or comment? Um, I believe that um, John Quincy Adams' light wife, Louisa, was um, the daughter of an American merchant who was doing business in London on the eve of the Revolution. And I was wondering how John Quincy Adams' parents felt about his foreign-born wife, and how did that affect John Quincy Adams' relationship with his parents? Are you uh, studying this in school? Um, well, sort of. <laughs> and why are you interested in this? Um, my younger sister is very interested in presidents, and we watch this, like, every day that it's on. So. And what is your name? Allison. What's your last name? Um, Hartrick. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Uh, as the introduction pointed out, uh, uh, Louisa Catherine Adams is the only first lady up until now at any rate who was not born in the United States. Because, however, her father was an American citizen, she was uh, an American uh, in terms of her citizenship uh, when she first visited the United States, which was not until she was 26 years old. Um, the fact that she was born in London, uh, I don't think particularly bothered John Quincy Adams, but it did bother his mother. Uh, she at one point referred to uh, this was before they were married, uh, to Louisa as a half-blood, uh, referring to the, the origins that you've mentioned. Louisa Catherine Adams had two problems. Uh, one was the fact that she, because she was born in England, a number of people thought she was an English woman uh, and had, was uh, an alien or an immigrant, which is, is not true, as I've said. And the other problem she had was, uh, was her mother-in-law, Abigail, who was a, uh, a formidable personality. And uh, in, the initial, in the early years, when, uh, after she married uh, John Quincy Adams and after she came to the United States, there was considerable friction between the two. In the long run, however, uh, it turned into uh, uh, not just uh, respect, but, uh, but affection. And by the time Abigail Adams died in 1818, 1818 they were very, very close. So uh, the question is very good, uh, and, and uh, she was able to overcome both the fact that they, she was seen as a foreigner by some people and the fact that uh, her mother-in-law never was quite, initially was not happy with the marriage, but later came to accept it. And uh, getting a call from a 14-year-old uh, who has a 13-year-old sister who's paying attention to this series, it reminds us that we want to make sure that teachers in the audience who want to get involved with our 41-part series can give us a call today, if you're watching, at 202-626-4858. That's 202-626-4858, or you can get to our C-SPAN, the classroom 
materials through cspan.org slash classroom. And every week during this series, John Wheeler, uh, who runs our education department, is finding a teacher or a student somewhere in the United States who is involved with a high school that is named after the president we're uh, featuring for the week. Becky Bloom is a fourth grade teacher. It's not just a high school, as you'll see. It's a, also a, a, a grade school. Uh, Becky Bloom is in Dallas, Texas, and she teaches at John Quincy Adams Elementary School. And she's on the line right now. We're going to ask her uh, what she can tell us uh, about why the school there in Dallas might be called John Quincy Adams. Are you there, Becky Bloom? Yes, I am here. Why do they call your school John Quincy Adams? Well, that's an interesting question. I've, I've tried to do a lot of research on this to see what I could find out, and um, I found out that the school was named John Quincy Adams in 1954 when our community, Pleasant Grove, was annexed into the Dallas community. But as to why they named it John Quincy Adams, I have to speculate because I have not been able to find any real reasons why. Um, I've, I've spoken with my fourth graders about this, and we've tried to come up with reasons, and uh, they decided that maybe they named the school John Quincy Adams simply because he was a president during the same period that uh, the first little red schoolhouse was built in our community, or um, maybe he was friends with Stephen F. Austin, or maybe because Pleasant Grove was an annexed community into Dallas, and he was against the annexation of Texas. Uh, when he was a representative, and maybe his name was chosen by a, a faction of people that did not want to be annexed into <laughs> Dallas. What do, the, what do your kids know about John Quincy Adams, or what do you teach them? Um, well, that's, uh, you know, in the past, we have, I have taught them about presidents that, uh, let's say, were outstanding. Uh, in February, of course, we always talk about George Washington and um, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, because that is African American History Month, and Abraham Lincoln did sign the Emancipation Proclamation. John Quincy Adams had never been uh, a big discussion, but he has this year, uh, since I was contacted by you. And uh, they know that um, he was the sixth president, and they also know that he was accused of uh, buying votes and probably lost re-election because of that, and that he was the only president who's father was president before him, which seemed to interest them since our governor will probably be running for president and may become the second president whose father was president before him. How long have you been teaching there? At John Quincy Adams? Uh, this yes. is my sixth year. Where do you come from originally? I'm originally from Missouri, but I've been in Texas now for 21 years. And how many students do you have there at John Quincy Adams Elementary School? I have 19. How many does this whole school um, teach every day? We have 900 and about 87, mostly Hispanic students. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Professor Parsons, um, she talked about the buying votes at the end of the first term. Why did he get, why was he defeated so significantly when his first term was over? She was referring to the, the alleged corrupt bargain that we talked about before. Um, I think he was, not reelected partly because of that but I also think that his gets back to the George Washington business that he believed that uh, public office was uh, something that should come to the individual the individual does not come to uh, does not seek it uh, at one point he referred to uh, what he called or what a friend of his called the Macbeth policy meaning uh, quoting from Shakespeare if chance will have me king will chance may crown me without my stir and that's kind of the way he wanted the presidency to come as it had come to Washington. And so he didn't really, uh, uh, he did not campaign for re-election. He didn't even use the office to, uh, to create friends through patronage. He believed that uh, if a person was doing a good job, uh, he should keep the job even though he might be, and in some cases he knew, he was working for Andrew Jackson. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a moving passage in, one, in the diary. One of his, uh, it may have been his son, one of his sons uh, said, uh, in effect, I'm paraphrasing, why don't you, when you travel through Pennsylvania, why don't you stop and uh, meet with the German-American uh, uh, community there and speak to them in their own language? Because John Quincy Adams uh, could speak a number of languages. He's probably the only president, I think, that was fluent in German. And uh, Adams wrote in his diary, in effect, if I do this, I've got to talk to other groups. 
uh, get tied up in cattle shows and, and, and fairs, and that's not, that's not what presidents do. Celeste Walker, when you are an associate editor of the Adams Papers, how many different Adams do you, papers do you look at? Uh, right now, we're, our primary project is publishing John Quincy Adams' diary, volumes three and four, which take him up through 1800. So basically 1789 to 1800. Uh, but I've also worked on the papers of John Adams and the Adams family correspondence, and also the diary of Charles Francis Adams. All right, of all the papers you've read and all the, you know, the, the people that you've gotten to know through the written word, and if you had a couple of hours where you could either uh, drink tea or walk through the Boston Commons with them, which one would you pick? Oh, that is a hard question. I would really like to be in Quincy before John Adams died, and, but when John Quincy Adams was there, and um, knock at the door of the house is one, as different people did, just to meet the presidents, uh, just to see the family, just to see, see them at home. I think that would be wonderful. Celeste Walker wants it all. You can see <laughs> <laughs> Shelburne, Vermont on the screen is the Adams Mansion. Off to the left there is the Stone Library, which was built by Charles Francis Adams. Go ahead, Shelburne, Vermont. You're on the air. Yes, in the late 1960s, uh, I worked for uh, Charles Francis Adams, who died recently. And my wife had a class with George Homans. As you remember, the Homans are direct descendants of the Adams. And... Uh, George uh, Homans always referred to his classes as gentlemen, even though they included women. And my, uh, and we lived at the time in Lexington, right on the green where the war started, and the British soldiers killed in the first battle were buried in the cemetery behind our house. But my question relates to Abigail and her influence on her husband and her son. Uh, she had said, uh, at the time the Constitution was being written, remember the ladies and also that all men would be tyrants if they could. She clearly felt uh, strongly about women's uh, suffragette and so forth. Is there any evidence in the writings of John Quincy uh, how he personally felt about the uh, women's role in, uh, in the polity and as opposed to what he might have felt the political realities were uh, since she was such a forceful woman did she not have effect upon her husband and her son concerning the rights of women? Thank you. Professor Parsons. As you probably know, uh, John Adams, uh, who was the recipient of the Remember the Ladies letter, uh, I don't think really took it seriously. And uh, there was not uh, much progress made uh, with regard to the status of women during the latter uh, 20 years of, of the 18th century when that letter was, was written. Uh, as for the impact of Abigail Adams on John Quincy, that's something that I'm not completely sure of myself. There's no question that as a mother, she had a great deal of influence. As a woman, I'm not quite sure. Uh, John Quincy Adams uh, was in many respects uh, a male chauvinist pig when it came to the role of women in society, with one exception. And that is, in the, again, in the 1830s, when he uh, introduced the petitions on support of anti-slavery cases. Many of them came from women, and he defended over and over again the right of women to submit petitions to Congress. But when it came to giving them the vote, he was opposed to it because, he said, you can never tell when wives will vote against their husbands and cancel out their vote. Anything in the uh, diaries or the works that you've read, Celeste Walker, on this issue? Uh, no, I don't think John Quincy Adams addresses this question, but it's very clear he had high expectations from his family, from his wife. Um, as we saw, tell her to pack up the house, come from Russia to Paris, that wasn't an easy thing to do. But as far as women and the right to vote, I don't think he ever addressed that question. Tucson, Arizona, go ahead, please. Hello, this is Philip Eklund. My question is, has to do with the political stance of John Quincy Adams. I wanted to know if he had a, um, fundamentally, he stood for something and followed consistent integrated political principles. Specifically, um, did he believe that national unity was more important than freedom? And did he believe that equality was more important than freedom? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> 
Anybody who lives 80 years and spends most of it in public life is probably going to have an uh, evolving position so that it's possible to say, well, at age 75, he contradicted something that he said when he was 30 years old. And I would answer your question this way. I think in the first half of his life, he believed that national unity and expansion, what would later be called manifest destiny, was more important than freedom. He had no real uh, reservations about uh, the United States expanding into territory, even if it meant uh, depriving uh, Indians of their right to their own lifestyle, or even in his early years uh, expanding the territory of slavery. But about halfway through, at about the time of his presidency, he begins to reverse his position. And in the second half of his life, I would say that he became more, his anti-slavery stance was more important than his nationalism. I don't know whether that answers your question entirely, but as I said, when, you, when you're dealing with a, a career that long, I don't care who the president is or who the statesperson is, there's going to be this ambivalence. But my, my, my quick analysis of it is the first half of his career, he was more nationalist than he was anti-slavery. The second half of his career, he was more anti-slavery than he was nationalist. Where is the State University of New York at Brockport? It's on the here? banks of the Erie Canal, about 20 miles uh, uh, west of, uh, of the city of Rochester a thriving uh, community of uh, extraordinary students and professors. Now, the, if I, my history, uh, I remember right, Erie Canal had something to do during that period of... It was completed uh, during, uh, during the, uh, the last few miles of it were completed during Adams' administration. And in fact, he called attention to it in his uh, first annual message, what we now call the State of the Union message. He specifically alluded to uh, the Empire State having, uh, he used flowery language, had wetted the waters of the Atlantic with the waters of the Lake Erie. Other than George Washington, and, uh, who died considerably earlier. Also, there were a lot of presidents alive up until the time that his father died in 1826 during his four years. Uh, during, yes, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Jefferson and, and, and his father and Madison and Monroe were all living uh, when he became president. Did he know them all? Oh, yes. He, uh, James Madison appointed him uh, minister to, uh, to Russia and he served as Secretary of State for uh, James Monroe and, of course, he knew Jefferson as a boyhood uh, uh, as a boyhood companion. Celeste Walker, are there any mentions in the diaries of John Quincy Adams about all the famous men and, and or women that we've, we've been talking about? Oh, he mentions everyone. When he's in Paris uh, with his father, he dines with Benjamin Franklin. He uh, walks with Thomas Jefferson. He, this, this was his circle. This, these were the people he grew up with. What kind of a, of a, a writing instrument did he use for these diaries? He, he used the pen um, that he would dip in the ink. Uh, as you can see, it's brown ink. It wasn't until later that uh, blue ink, that I've ever seen blue ink, much later in papers. So his entire diaries, uh, all the diaries were in brown ink? Yes, or it's a little bit darker sometimes, but it's set brown rather than blue. What kind of paper? Oh, it's thick very uh, high rag, high cotton content paper that has lasted very well over 200 plus years. Bethany, Oklahoma, good morning. Morning. I uh, <clears throat> found a poem that was in the front of a book that was uh, actually written by John Quincy Adams about himself. The uh, poem is entitled uh, Massachusetts and I would like to read it to you. It consists of about five lines. Go right ahead. John Quincy Adams of Quincy. And with the name, why should the pen forbear the bosom's wishes breathe in fervent prayer <clears throat> that years in long succession still may find the volume's owner blessed with peace of mind, with joy unmingled from the cup of woe, with all that braids the wreath of blessed below, till earth shall yield in friendship and in love her glowing gleams to brighten rays above. And it was interesting to me that he asked for peace of mind, uh, joy, and love in the last years of his life in this point. Is that, uh, is that written in the book itself, uh, in his handwriting? It's in his handwriting. The page was torn from the book. Uh, it was written in January the 19th, 1837. Why are you interested in this, Carl? Uh, <clears throat> I collect presidential history and um, 
What you have there is, is an example of what Adams was asked to do increasingly toward the end of the last 10 years of his life. Young, usually young women, uh, but not always, uh, present him with copies of books and ask him to write something in it uh, as an autograph. And he sometimes not only signed it, but also wrote a few lines of verse. He's one of uh, two or three presidents, uh, Jimmy Carter being the most recent, who aspired uh, to poetry. Um, there's mixed reviews on the quality of his verses, but uh, that, what you have there is an example of, of that, that interest that he had. Celeste so Walker, do you get many uh, oh, high school, grade school kids that come through here for tours and look at things like uh, the diaries that you're working on? Uh, we get quite a bit of interest uh, from students around the time of the National History Day celebrations. Uh, the society, because it's relatively small with a small staff, we don't have many uh, public programs for students, although um, many teachers, they make arrangements to bring their students in for a tour, and we put out items that we think they'll be interested in. Do you think people use this place as much as they should? I think there are many people who may not know about it and, and don't use it, but I do think, echoing Bill Fowler, that if you are working in American history, uh, you almost have to come here for early American history, and it seems to me that you would find out about us. Our microfilm of the Adams Papers is located, however, at uh, over 90 libraries uh, throughout the country. So somebody can read this at a local college library, let's say, or a very large municipal library somewhere else. What happens if you want to buy all the microfilm? What does it cost for all the John Quincy Adams diaries? I don't know what the cost is now. University microfilms um, markets them for us, though. I'm sure they'd be happy to. But it's expensive, I would guess. It's expensive, yes. Tracy, California, you're next. Go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I, I could, uh, comments and, quest, and a question. I visited the homes and uh, burial sites in 1995 and enjoyed my time there. And I also liked the uh, bookstore slash gift shop. I thought it was very well stocked. I had a great time over there in Quincy. Uh, my question to Mr. Parsons and Ms. Walker, how did Adams feel about President Jackson, Van Buren, Tyler, and Polk? And did he provide advice to any of them? I'll take my answer on the air. Thank you very much. <laughs> John Quincy Adams was uh, one of those people who was sure that the institution of the presidency and possibly the entire United States had gone into decline as a result of the election of all of the people that you have mentioned. Uh, that didn't prevent him, with the exception of Andrew Jackson, uh, didn't prevent him from time to time from offering advice, uh, which was sometimes uh, followed and sometimes not. I should say that uh, in spite of the animus that Adams had toward Van Buren and Polk in particular, uh, they always went out of their way to uh, to be nice to him and respect him because after all he came from in a sense a different generation and uh, he was always uh, at ceremonies for example inaugurations and so forth given a place of honor which he usually accepted but he uh, he had little use uh, for any of those presidents because their principles usually involved uh, some kind of defense of slavery uh, and uh, too much emphasis on states' rights, whereas we've already established he came from the nationalist tradition. And as I've said, he never, uh, he never fully recovered, I think, from the fact that the people, the second time around, didn't come to him the way they had come to George Washington. As I said in concluding pages of my uh, biography, I think the story of the Adams family, and that's both father and son, is one of unrequited love. Uh, they loved their country passionately. But their country did not love them back with the same kind of passion that they had for it. And they never really could quite understand that. Here's your book. Is it still available for people if they want to buy it? Oh, yes. Yep. Madison House, uh, published in Madison House uh, 19, last year, 1960. Madison House Madison Publishers, Ma Madison, Wisconsin. That's correct. When, was it, when did you write this? When did it, what, was it Off and on over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And when did it come out? It came out this last year, 1990. Just last year? Yeah. And Celeste Walker, you have uh, a document that you were showing us there. What is it in front of you? Uh, what I have in front of me, um, one of the questions we get asked more than anything is how did the papers get here? How did they stay together? And, and the real reason for that is that the family kept the papers together from generation to generation. Uh, 
willing it to the next generation. Uh, so they didn't get scattered among numerous descendants. Uh, what we have here is the deed of gift that John Adams dictated to John Quincy Adams, where he says, I hereby give to my son John Quincy Adams, and then skips down, all my manuscript letter books, account books, letters, journals, and manuscript papers. This is uh, written in 1818 at the same time where he wrote his will. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he also, in this deed of gift, lists a silver tankard, which he presents to John Quincy Adams. Well, the Historical Society doesn't have many artifacts, but we do have the silver tankard that's here. And interestingly enough, John Quincy Adams, in his will, while he gave his papers to his son, he gave the silver tankard to his daughter-in-law, Abigail Brooks Adams, um, whom he was very fond of. We have a lot of uh, statistics about presidents as it relates to John Quincy Adams. I want to read you. And we also have a camera uh, in the foyer uh, outside here at the Massachusetts Historical Society so you can see what it looks like if you were coming to visit on Boylston Street. Uh, John Adams is one of 10 presidents to have def been defeated seeking re-election. That's a 10 of 41. The other nine are John Adams, Martin Van Buren, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, William Howard Taft, Herbert Hoover, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and George Bush. He's one of the two presidents elected by the House of Representatives along with Thomas Jefferson. He's one of four presidents born in Massachusetts along with John Adams, John Kennedy, and George Bush. He's one of 15 presidents to have served in the U.S. Senate before becoming president. He's the only president to go on to serve in the U.S. House. However, Andrew Johnson went on to the Senate after he was um, out of office in, 19, in 1868. He's one of six presidents to have previously served as Secretary of State along with Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Martin Van Buren, and James Buchanan. He's one of four Unitarian presidents along with John Adams, Millard Fillmore, and William Howard Taft. He's one of six presidents who attended Harvard he was 57 years old when he uh, became president, meaning that he was 61 when he was out of office. That's so right. for those 20 years, 17 of them were in the House, how much time did he spend here in Massachusetts versus Washington, D.C.? You mean out of office or no, just as resident? You no, know, I mean, how in those days, how much time would you not spend in the capital? In, in those days, uh, if, if you had uh, a home in New England, uh, you generally avoided Washington in the, uh, in the summertime for air conditioning. So they spent most of their summers uh, here in, uh, in Quincy. Or here Professor in Parsons and Celeste, we we'll go to Knoxville, Maryland. Go ahead, please. Hi there. I want to thank C-SPAN for doing this great series. Um, I had a question about... Uh, when John Quincy Adams was Secretary of State um, under the Monroe administration, uh, he was involved in one of the first disarmament deals in the history of the United States, maybe the world. It was called. It was an agreement with uh, Great Britain for disarmament of the Great Lakes. It was called the Rush Bago Agreement. I think the pronunciation is right. Uh, anyway, uh, there was an interesting question about that uh, with regard to whether why John Quincy Adams didn't. Uh, have President Monroe submit that to the Senate for a formal two-thirds vote as a treaty. Uh, he, instead, they called it an agreement uh, and, and tried to uh, uh, do it without going to the Senate. And I was wondering if you folks have any insights into why Adams and Monroe chose that route. I, eventually, they did go to the Senate when the senators made a fuss. But I was wondering, initially, they, they chose not to, and I, I'm curious uh, why that was. I'm not sure... On the details, you may know more about this than I do. Uh, this was something that was negotiated not by Adams, uh, but by the acting Secretary of the State, uh, Secretary of State at the time, uh, Richard Rush, hence the name. I believe at the time uh, Adams was on his way uh, back to the United States from London to accept the appointment as Secretary of State. And the fact that Adams himself, although I'm sure he approved of the, uh, the agreement, uh, was not directly involved. I think that may be part of the answer. Beyond that, um, I'm not. I'm not sure. As I say, this this may be something you know more about than I do. Palm Desert, California. Go ahead, please. Hello, Palm Desert. Yes, sir. Hello. You're on Hello. the air, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, buongiorno. Just saw a beautiful desert sunrise here. I'm calling mainly about the Boylston family. 
And I wondered if you had any comments regarding the uh, influence that it might have had his relationship from the standpoint of uh, inheriting the Boylston intellect, uh, their social position, and from a Yankee standpoint, maybe their money. Thank you, Connor. Who are the Boylstons? Uh, Celeste may have to help me on this one. Uh, uh, John Adams' mother, I believe, was a Boylston. Uh, and the Boylston name comes up very frequently. Thomas Boylston Adams was the name that uh, they gave to their, one of their sons, and that was also passed on uh, by uh, John Quincy and his sons down there. Beyond that, uh, I'm not sure, and there was a Boylston professorship at Harvard for many years. I'm not sure whether it's still there or not. But maybe Celeste can help uh, us on this one, too. Anything to add, Celeste Walker? Well, the Boylstons were cousins, and they, uh, I'm sure, uh, they inherited the intellect. Uh, the, many Boylstons were doctors, many were merchants. I don't know that any money came their way through the Boylstons, though. Sterling, Connecticut. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, we have articles. My name is Lita, and we have several articles on my great-grandmother, and her name was... Susan Pauline Adams, she was born 12-10-1842, and she was a direct descendant of John Quincy. And we're wondering um, who, how she was related, how we would research this. Any ideas, Celeste Walker? Well, there a, was a book published in 1898 which lists all the descendants of the original Henry Adams that came to this country. Uh, it's a book by Andrew N. Adams, and it's called uh, Henry Adams of Braintree. And I think if you go to your local library, they should be able to get, get it for you on interlibrary loan because it has been reprinted within the past 20 years or so, I think. By the way, if people want to reach you, I, I understand that tomorrow because of the marathon here that you're not going to be open. Is that correct? We won't be open because it's Patriot's Day. Ah, not because of the... No. <laughs> the marathon. <laughs> we won't be here because of the marathon, I can tell you. Exactly. You have a final document you want to show us on Amistad? Yes, I have uh, two things here of interest. Uh, this is a letter from one of the African captives. It's uh, a letter from Kale, and he says, Dear friend Mr. Adams, I want to write a letter to you because you love Mendy people and you talk to the great court. He wrote this letter after Adams had uh, agreed to take the case, but before he had uh, appeared before the court. He goes on to say, Jose Ruiz, say we born in Havana, he tell lie. Uh, we stay in Havana 10 days and 10 nights. We stay no more. We all born in Mendy. Uh, at this time, the captives had been here about a year and a half, uh, I don't know if, clearly this letter was dictated, I don't know who wrote it, though. I don't know if, if the captives learned how to write. By the way, we're out of time. Uh, once again, wrapping this up, you've been here how long? I've been here 25 years. What's the best thing about this job for you? Oh, the best thing is, is sitting there and reading the manuscripts and reading something you've never seen before and probably no one's ever noted down. Thanks for doing this for us this morning. Well, Thank you for coming. Sunday morning. Professor Parsons, what, uh, what do you dislike the most about uh, John Quincy Adams? The great fear that uh, if I make a generalization about him, I will have overlooked something uh, that contradicts it. There's so, such a mass of material uh, that it's virtually impossible for one uh, human being to say with authority that they have read everything that's relevant that John Quincy Adams ever said or did. I want to thank the staff of the Massachusetts Historical Society for letting us come here on a Sunday morning and um, also uh, the uh, Speaker of the House for letting us put a camera in Statuary Hall on a day when there are a lot of tourists there. Tina Tate who helped us in the gallery down there in the House Radio and Television Gallery. The uh, Cablevision Systems of Boston, a big cable system in this area surrounding this whole town. And the staff of the Adams National Historical Park, Marianne Peake, Superintendent over there in Quincy. And uh, back home in Washington, our education staff is in today, ready to take your calls. One more time, we'll give you the telephone number. It's 202-626-4858 and cspan.org slash classroom. Call them now if you're interested in joining Cable in the Classroom. For all teachers, it's free of charge. We will not bug you in the future with any kind of solicitation whatsoever. And we thank uh, our viewers who always bring to this a special spontaneity and to the young folks who are calling. Have a good day.
more on the life of the nation's sixth president, John Quincy Adams. In a moment, a look at how he impacted the founding of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. This segment's a little under 10 minutes. The Smithsonian began in 1835 when President Andrew Jackson received a letter from England from uh, a 